So now this is something I don't get to see every day. No, it isn't, and especially not something that you usually get to climb into either. Although, in fairness, at Tankfest, they, they did actually let the public get into the Challenger 2 there. Yeah. But uh, yeah, as, as I just said, it is the Challenger 2. It is the current main battle tank of the British Army, and it is a beast. It is a, I mean, it's a great tank with its limitations, uh, but they're working on it. It's, it. There's an improvement program going on, but this just looks awesome. This is, I mean, if I was a 13-year-old boy drawing a tank, it would look something like this. It really would. Yeah. Uh, it's 70 something tons of imposing British steel. And uh, with the new suspension, I, I am so jealous of how the British system works. For so, you know, the way I always wrap it on about tensioning track uh, and how it takes forever on any particular vehicle. The driver has a button. Well, actually, it's a lever, I think, but it's, it's, it's an automatic system. You're going, why can't we do that? But uh, so, I mean, th this is an early version. You've got the Commander's Independent Viewer up there. It wasn't on the production vehicles initially, although it did show up in the export models and eventually would show up later. Uh, thermal Imager is on top of the gun tube, which I have questions about because, I mean, if you're shooting at a target way down there, the gun is now in between the, the, uh, the sight and the tube. But I think we should go in. Let's check it out. I want to go in. Let's go in. This is cool. Yep, uh, we are now inside Challenger 2. Although admittedly you're missing the gunner's primary sight system, but uh, your controls are still there. And I've always found those to be incredibly unique controls. I mean, look at your impression of them, how would you use it? Um, this looks like it, I have, there's two handles here, but it's very stationary. They don't move at all. No. So keep looking. All right, we have something here. No, no, for the, you, you have that. Remember, you're gonna be operating this holding on to the, holding on to the Control handles. Right. Does it remind you of anything, maybe, the, the kind of control handle? Kind of of the M60, a little bit. Mm. Does it also remind you a little bit, maybe, of a PlayStation control handle? That, too. How do you operate a PlayStation? Well, with the buttons. Uh, and how, what's the joystick? Well, we have, normally there's like a, like a D-pad, and then you have an analog stick, so... Yep. So, under your right thumb there, just left a little bit. This one? That should be. Is it there? Yeah. It's like a D-pad. Yeah, it's basically how you operate your gun. So the control handles are absolutely fixed, which uh, actually is a brilliant idea hmm. because remember, the, your, your gun system is stabilized. Right. But are you stabilized? Not necessarily. No, so how do you stabilize this? I mean, how do you hold on to yourself and stop yourself from getting bashed everywhere? Well, I can hold it on. You're things. holding on to those. Yeah. And, if you, and if those things are fixed, then you can use it for support and you're not gonna put in what are called false inputs mm. uh, by being through. And of course you also have the chest pad here that can come against your chest and you, you, you hold yourself on. So, they, I mean, it looks, uh, it's a brilliant idea because of course kids today, they're, they're growing up, joining the army, they already know how to use PlayStations. And everything is just there done with your thumbs on, on this PlayStation-like controller. It's a genius idea. Uh, but, uh, I mean, you, you were in Centurion a little earlier and you got a little bit more room. Yeah, this is this is uh, considerably less cramped. A lot more comfortable. You're there for hours, and the sights are reasonably located for you. You got a thermal uh, view up there, and uh, a whole bunch of very easily labeled switches on your right. I mean, I, I, I bet you, if you, it's, because it's so logical, I bet you can tell me what each and every one of those knobs does almost just by looking at it. Yeah, everything's really well labeled. I'm not familiar with what an MRS is. Oh, it was a reference system. Oh. So that's the, um, that's the, at the very end of the gun tube, you'll see a little bulge. Mm -hmm. And what that does is it te it's a system of telling the site where the end of the gun tube is comp compared to where the computer thinks it is. So after you fire a few rounds, the gun gets hotter, it expands, uh, the vibrations affect, and sometimes your sight is actually off compared to the gun tube. So by using the muzzle reference system, it can, it can counteract for that. Gotcha. So thermal imager, focus gains, of course this thing will see at night. Um, uh, your selectors for the, uh, you know, the, what we have here is laser, first return, last return. Mm -hmm. And that is, uh, if there are obstructions for the laser, you can see, uh, you get the correct return back into it. But the most commonly used, most commonly used uh, switches are the ones that are directly in front of you. So uh, if, you, if you look at them, you know, daylight or thermal imager. So if you're looking at the night site, you want to look at the day site, you just use your left thumb. Wow. If you want to zoom in, zoom out, you click that thing that says mag. Uh, laser and, uh, 
uh, laser delay was uh, would be for you know the laser rangefinder and the fire control system, which is actually very similar to that of the M1A2. Uh, big toggle on for your right thumb, coax off main. As uh, so which gun are you going to shoot? Right. It's a chain gun for some reason on this. Not sure why. And then you got a, a strange controller for your the Hesh round uh, as, as on the right, the add drop thing, which this I don't thing. truly understand. Uh, I'm sure somebody who's actually a Challenger 2 gunner can probably tell you. But uh, I mean, this is just ergonomics as it goes on. As things get more and better designed, people think, how do you use these? And uh, as you can see, this is awesome. It's literally at your fingertips. Everything. It's, it's, uh, the pilot's call a hand on throttle and stick. Uh, I don't know what the tank equivalent is, but it makes sense. Yeah. I mean, just they think about this, and it gets better and better and better. What are some of the main things that we learned from the Challenger One that were implemented here into the Challenger Two? Uh, do everything better. Uh, so you have a better. There's a new gun, the L30 instead of the L11, which was a holdover from the Chieftain. But it uses the same three-piece ammunition. So you've got the projectile, which will be stowed behind me. You've got the bag charges, which are stowed below the turret ring, mm. because that's safer. Uh, and then you've got, a, it's called a vent tube, which is, looks a bit like a 50 caliber uh, shell casing. And uh, you fling those three in. It's, it's actually pretty fast. If you, if you watch a competent uh, uh, operator, they call them here, uh, loading the L30, it is actually a very fast process. <laughs> Um, the stabilization system is improved, the fire control system, it's, so the IFCS was what Chieftain used and very similar to what uh, Challenger 1 used. This is now an Abrams type fire control system, very accurate, uh, I believe, done by the Canadians. Uh, I'm, I'm not quite sure quite how it works out, but it's one of those uh, Canadian companies that submitted the bid and won, yay. Um, Something super distinct is not how how you mentioned in in previous videos. The the ammunition is not stored out in the open. You have these bins. Yeah, the the, the bag charges are in the Only bins. There but up high, it's like a saber round, there's nothing explosive in a saber round. Right, it's just, just it's just a big piece of metal. Yeah. yeah. So there's no problem with that being up in the bustle, completely exposed. How many know? can fit up in here? Uh, I honestly have no idea, hmm. but I'm going I'm to assume about twenty or tw twenty five. Um, so I, I guess I have some idea. But uh, again, I mean, if, if those things, if it gets hit and things go flying around, you're probably not alive anyway because of the amount of force that, that it takes to get a Sabre projectile to move around like that if it's mm -hmm. trapped in. And there's a couple of rounds under the gun tube there as well, you can see. That's it. Uh, the coax, for some reason, they went with a chain gun. I'm not sure. I've never actually played with their, their coaxial machine gun. So uh, What's the difference? Uh, um, most machine guns are operated by uh, gas. Basically, the gas either uh, uses a recoil force or the gas goes forward into a piston, into a gas tube, uses a piston and recycles uh, cycles the bolt that way. The chain gun is electric. Mm -hmm. So there is actually a little chain, I mean, it looks like a small bicycle chain, that goes around uh, four cogs uh, in, a, in an orbit, and each time it does an orbit, the gun cycles once. So up, you know, if the, if the uh, the index tab, or I can't remember the exact name of it, is up at the front left. Let's say it's in the uh, breech lock ready to fire position. As it goes right, it triggers it, comes back, it starts the extraction cycle, comes left, you feed the round, comes uh, forward and it locks the bolt. And this electric driven motor is what actually operates the, operates the gun. I'm not sure I, I see the advantage to it over a regular machine gun, but obviously somebody does who gets paid a lot more than I do. To understand these things, yeah. But um, yeah, it's uh, it's a nice privilege to be inside a Challenger too. Yeah. And of course, you got the you know, big, thick armor. I mean, again, you see how big the turret is on the outside. Yeah, the thing's massive. The thing's absolutely massive. But you can see on the inside, you know, how how much metal there is between where you are. And it's not just metal; it's plastics and space and all sorts of other things that we're not allowed to talk about or That's know. Right. Um, and, and I don't know, honestly, mm. because, again, I don't need to. Uh, but uh, this is considered to be one of the safest tanks to get hit in of any. Merkava is up there, and the Swedes have an argument for the STRV-122. But uh, if, you, if you're going to take a hit, you, you, you do very well to take a hit in this thing. It has a record to prove it. It does. Uh, there's what, like 70-something. Well, no, no. Uh, there's a 13 RPG hits, I think, in one particular tank. Good lord. Uh, uh, just, oh, no, oh, look, he shot at me. Haha. <laughs> Bad move. Uh, this thing's formidable as 
formidable as anything on the battlefield. Yeah, and, and especially given that there's not actually all that many of these things left, I think they're just announced going down to two two regiments. Uh, the British uh, train hard, and you know, as I've always said, what's really important in the modern tank is how good the crew is, mm. and you know the British trained their tankers well. Uh, let's see. Anything yeah. else to be said around here? I've already mentioned the, the driver's position because he's got the, the awesome tack tension system. Uh, this is a, this is a lovely little well design. I wouldn't mind going to war in this. I'm, I like my Abrams. I think I probably still prefer my Abrams because I'm used to it, but uh, I would not mind going to war in this tank. It was incredibly cool to see it in motion at Tank Fest in the arena. Oh, and it's fast. It's so fast, and the turret moves so fast. Like, you see that thing swing around, and it's like... Oh. Yeah, straight on, and, and again, because you got the commander's uh, designate function on you know, after the upgrades, and it's stabilized. So as the thing's going around, I don't know if you noticed, the the, dry, the gunner would occasionally pick a guy in the crowd, hmm. and he'd track that guy for a second or two before moving on. And the, the gun tube is just dead still hmm. as, as it's doing this. Just like super smooth, and the thing's going, it's turning, the turret's staying, yep. it's super smooth. Oh, that driver was having the time of his life. I mean, <laughs> you, 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 saw, you saw the tank coming around, skidding around corner. Mm -hmm. I mean, this guy's tail sliding, yeah, the Challenger too. But again, it weighs 70 tons, so there is going to be inertia yeah. uh, for when you stop or when you go around the corner. And but for 70 tons, it sure looks nimble in motion. It does, it does. And uh, again, modern technology compared to those early tanks that were going around like the Matilda, mm -hmm. is going crank, 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 and what they're doing now is it's night and day. You can imagine if you were if you were a World War One tanker, and you and you came out and you saw one of these things going around. Well, that, would, that would be a significant emotional event almost. It was crazy to see. Um, I think it was a tank fest maybe two or three years ago when they had their replica of the first of one. the Mark IV. That's yes. right. And then. Next to the challenge, it's... it's yeah, and, and, and the Mark IV, you know, is, is just, you just see this tr band of tracks, it look very, uh, Fletcher would call it very spooky looking. Yeah. And, and it, uh, especially, you don't know what a tank was supposed to be to begin with, that would, that would be a good reason, but, uh, yeah, and it's only been, what, a hundred years? That's right. Uh, since, since tanks were uh, developed, and it's... Uh, actually, something I noticed the other day is that, uh, you know those beautiful cars from the 1930s, like the Duesenbergs, the, the gorgeous looking designs? And then you go to the muscle cars, like the Chargers and so on. Those two vehicles are a lot closer to each other than the muscle cars are to what we're driving today mm. in terms of years. Mm. And probably technology as well. And it's just the speed of advance is amazing. But that, that is a bit of a digression. That's right. Yeah, do, talking about classic cars when we're sitting in a Challenger 2. And it's, you're sitting in a Challenger 2 when you're talking about classic cars. <laughs> nothing, nothing wrong with a good old ramble, but it's, uh, just, it's amazing to see. It's quite a privilege um, for myself to be able to sit in one of these things. It's an impressive machine. What if we can get him to, to let us drive it? Oh. Mm. I would hope. Maybe Are you someday. sure we can't start this up? Well, we take it for a spin? It, it's uh, fully working. You could drive it. Um, However, um, it would set all the smoke alarms off. Oh. And, uh, oh. Worth it. Worth we it. it. Worth get into it. trouble. <laughs> yeah, but we'd be in a tank. Yeah. yeah. How much trouble can we get into? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> to get in trouble, they'd have to get into the tank. Yeah. To get us properly yeah. in trouble. <laughs> yeah, granted, we, we would have to run out of gas eventually. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> You're not my father. <laughs> Real dad. <laughs> <laughs> this is cool. This is cool. It's interesting. I want one now. Yeah, I want one. Santa Claus can take note, but something that I don't know. Being able to be inside one of these things and sort of see the function um, just just brings up just how one can relate to and understand this, and just brings up my level of respect and interest in the crews and these who serve. Yeah, because when, when you're playing World of Tanks, you don't see it. All, all you see is the outside of the tank, right? Tank yeah. just around, and, and it's lots of fun, but yeah, as you're saying, once you're inside, then you get to see, well, this is what is actually happening inside the tank. What better way to connect than to see it and experience some perspective for yourself? Yeah. And this, yeah. Is, this, this tank is way too young for World of Tanks at this time, but... This it, it retains some of the features that we know from some of the earlier tanks that, that we've been in. Well, I, I mean, you got your manual handles for there. For so if something goes wrong, if you go down to steam gunnery, what we call, well, you've lost all your electrics. You can still operate this with basic World War II technology. You have got your elevation handle there, which uh, I mean, I don't know, will it will it, will it crank? Uh, so does it have hydraulics to crank? No, no, actually, actually, crank you it. You have around. to crank it around. Yeah, yeah. Oh. Okay, so there you go. Yeah, so there you, it can, goes. you can raise and lower it. 
And you can probably find the traverse off to your right there. Where are we at? Oh, here it is. There it is. Yeah, hidden a little bit. Yeah. What a traverse? Or is the turret lock on? There is, a, there is probably a turret lock somewhere nope. around here. All right, so the tur turret lock must be on. No, there you go. It's yeah, cool. you're spinning it. It's cool. Uh, so between that and the auxiliary site in front of you there, uh, you know, a World War II tanker can probably engage tank. A tanker, oh, yeah. a tanker from some past generations might just have to be familiar maybe with some of the terms for their, to, to fully be able to make use of it, but get right in the seat, and like you mentioned, hmm. you'd know exactly what controls are what and be able to roll with yeah, that. Um, yeah, you can, you can always operate a tank on the most basic level by use of the mechanical controls. Hmm. They haven't changed. The principles of tanking haven't changed. Just the technology has made it faster hmm. and further away and more lethal. More yeah, more efficient. Deadlier, but also safer for the crews inside. There, there's a big red button here. Yeah. I am debating pushing the, the, the big red button. It's uh, always, yeah, it's like it's, they say not to, but there's something... There, there, there's something that just draws you to pushing the red button. There's innate appeal. Yeah, you should push the red button. I think I'll push the red Don't button. Don't push the red button. Don't do it! Do it, do it, do it. 